the specialty of dermatology um, actually arose um, from venereology. And a bit of the history would be uh, uh, in maybe the 18th, 19th century where, where there was a lot of syphilis and syphilis has cutaneous skin manifestations. So there was a <coughs> the, the, the specialists who eventually became dermatologists were actually very, very schooled in syphilology in those days. So that was the, the origin of, of the joint discipline, joint specialty, dermatovenereology. <coughs> so uh, our training and, and schooling in Western medicine comes obviously from, from Europe. And that was how the specialty was imported or uh, developed in Singapore, dermatovenereology. Um, so for many years, the specialists were seeing patients in various other hospitals, not National Skin Centre. Its immediate predecessor was the Middle Road Hospital. Okay? And that was closed and we opened a skin centre in 1988. So in 1988, um, the authorities thought that they would uh, manage publicly funded, subsidised STI care in Kelantan Lane. And therefore, the, uh, therefore the services were in a sense split <clears throat> so, that's in Clanton Lane and dermatology patients, are, skin patients are seen here. Um, so, that's the, that's the origin. I think over the years, uh, I mean, we've, we've had very good notification. It's as certain STIs are notifiable by law, syphilis, um, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, <clears throat> um, chancroid. Those are the big ones. Uh, um, warts and herpes are not. Uh, herpes is notifiable. The warts are not notifiable. So if you look at the trends, we can we usually only monitor. Uh, we are able to monitor closely those which are notifiable. Um, it was much higher in the eighties, even seventies and eighties. Okay, and uh, um, since then, let's come down somewhat uh, to a fairly uh, plateau-like. Um, numbers of notification. I think <coughs> the, the total notifications of the diseases which I mentioned is about 7,000 over cases a year. Uh, it's, it's fairly <coughs> stable from the total numbers point of view. I, I think a HIV is one of those things as well. We've been relatively successful like, up to now in controlling the steep rise which has been seen, which was seen in the early phases of the epidemic. Um, but certainly, we, we are still um, receiving about 300 notifications of, of newly diagnosed HIV a year. So that's also sort of plateaued out in the last three to four years. Hmm. That's a very, it's a, it's a very long, it's a, uh, the two parts of the question, one of them is a clinical management, another one is social attitudes towards HIV. I think clinical management is probably best left to my clinical colleagues. I don't personally manage patients um, in HIV. Uh, in the early years, yeah, when I was, I, I used to go to uh, a J clinic in CDC, <clears throat> but not anymore because I've got, I think that the, um, the management is best, uh, you know, left to the ID physicians in hospitals. Although nowadays, in many parts of the world, they're actually managed by primary physicians with an interest in HIV because of the huge advances in, in clinical care, medication, treatment, and, and, and it's become a chronic manageable disease. ID physicians don't really need to be writing prescriptions every few months. Um, I, think, I think that it's the, the, those advances have changed completely, you know, the concept, the, the reality of HIV infection. For a person getting HIV today, and see, I, I think the, the calculations recently, in, I think in the UK, they've done the modeling, a person under 25 who's diagnosed with HIV under 25 and, and gets onto optimal care, currently known optimal care, can live as long or even longer than the person without HIV, without HIV infection because of the fact that he or she is in contact with um, professionals and keep their health good and are on highly effective antiretroviral medications. So that's completely changed, changed the complexion. Um, regarding social attitudes, uh, I think that we have some made some headway. I think you know many people. Uh, well, I won't. I won't. I won't. I can't say how many percent are more tolerant or accepting 
of a person with HIV working in, an, working in their office, for example. Uh, it's hard to really gauge. Um, we've done, there have been national surveys um, and which have shown slight improvements in, in understanding and acceptance and uh, therefore less discriminatory attitudes and stigmatization. But I think it's still pervasive. I, I think that, that uh, it's a, we have a long, long way to go where it comes to um, making HIV a medical disease and not necessarily uh, something you judge a person for. Because I think that's, that just makes the control program worse. It's clearly a, um, not the right thing to do. So, you know, I think we still have an uphill battle to, to change the attitudes. Um, and this is, you know, for the lay public, I think, I think that even, unfortunately to say, healthcare professionals also are, are part of that problem. Okay, so you went a bit of genesis. <laughs> I came back from my, in those days it wasn't called HMDP. I, 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 was, I was, did my postgraduate qualifications in, the, in London in the mid-80s. And that was when it all started. So, you know, even when I was there in the 80s, you know, I, 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 I wasn't directly involved, okay? But I was doing my dermatology and venereology training there. And then the whole pandemic exploded. Um, so when I came back I, I, and I looked around, and it, <coughs> it is a sexually transmitted disease after all. Of course, there are certain areas where IV drug use, uh, the epidemic due to sharing needles is much higher. Um, but by and large, it is STD. It is, it is, the prevention and control is an STD prevention control. And that's where I thought that I could perhaps do something because there was really nothing available at that point in time. The information obviously was scarce, although it was building up. And, and um, when you want to reach a population, you need to know how to reach a population and have the capacity to do it. And, and there was zero. So I set up AFA as a NGO, non-government organization, who would be able to move things especially education, especially changing attitudes, especially um, advocating for infected persons and high-risk groups. <clears throat> so that was how I got involved, and I'm still here after 20, 27 years, um, sort of you know, helping, m making sure it continues, that it changes its, its you know, I mean, as, as, as much as, you know, in the early years, we, we started, we were the first people who pushed to bring antiretroviral medications. We used to, when it wasn't available here, you know, we, we used to hand carry stuff from Australia. Um, we used to fund very, very basic, in those days, care, like, you know, for example, pneumococcal vaccine, we used to pay for it. We used to aerosolize pentamidine, we used to pay for it. It was beyond the capacity of patients to pay in those days. Um, and over the years, we've advocated for making treatment accessible. Without a lot of our programs, many more people would be dead by now, I think, and continue to push for the rights of infected persons as human beings and not to be considered as criminals or lepers. So that's our role. And our, and our role, I mean, we also pioneered several other things. For example, testing. Testing is a centerpiece of any prevention program. So we from very early on, you know, managed to um, work with MOH to allow anonymous testing, to overcome the fear of testing from members of the public, to make it easier for them to, to remove one of the barriers, which was having to go to a clinic doctor and tell them I want an HIV test. I think, you know, it's, it's, proved, it's proved very, very successful. Um, a few years ago, we embarked on a linkage to care because there's no point testing when we don't offer a direct link to care. So we introduced, for example, uh, uh, we, tried, we incentivized a linkage to care. And that has been hugely successful. For the 80 to 90% of people who test positive and are Singaporeans are linked to care immediately. So that is another thing. I mean, it's the little things like that. It's an ongoing effort to, 
overcome barriers and look for new ways to... Because prevention is... And, and is, as you know, prevention and treatment are the same thing now. You can't prevent if you don't provide treatment. And treatment is a very strong preventative measure. It's like any infectious disease. If you treat the, infe if you treat the person, he or she is not infectious to other people. Right? And now the, the new thing with using antiretroviral drugs as preventative measure for non-infected persons, we really have to look at that and how we can integrate it into our programs. So those are some of the things we do. We, we have a lot of programs going, but you know, we're a very small organization. It's, been, it's not been easy to get funding, cooperation, acceptance, but you know, there's a, a f small bunch of us who have stuck it out. And of course, with the, a lot of help of the ID physicians, they've been great supporters, not just in CDC, but also SGH, NUH. I mean, they've been great. Um, we've got great allies in them, and we've got great allies in some uh, in, in, in areas of the private sector. And I think ministry has been very helpful as well. You see that prize there? That, get, that gold medal there was given by WHO to us. It's a memorial medal which was um, given once a year to some organization in the whole world for uh, this is a memorial prize for one of their previous director generals. So I, was, I had to go to Geneva. I think MOH suggested in, and it was a competition. And I, I mean, I think I saw, I, I brought up a few things earlier on. I mean, uh, for the HIV part, I think it's still, you know, it, it's, it's been a while it's not a new disease. It's lost its trendiness in a sense. Um, but if you look at the epidemic around the world, it, it continues unabated in many countries. And in, 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 in some places, it continues to increase. Um, and these are often amongst MSM, amongst uh, in countries where there are no programs for all sorts of things. You know, uh, So we, the, the challenges now is not just the stigma and discrimination point of view, but but um, the attitude is that it is not a deadly disease. It is not something which we need to fear because all I need to do is take a couple of tablets a day. Um, a sense of inertia, uh, fatigue. And it's not just the fatigue and the inertia of... of um, healthcare workers and healthcare professionals and policy makers. It is that of the general public. Because the impression that he's just taking a few pills a day doesn't dawn on a, <laughs> on, on, on a person who might get infected because you know, it's not completely free of toxicity. Um, being known to be HIV positive is still carries a huge burden. Having to take a pill or well, even two pills a day or three pills a day is still something which is I mean, conceivably for the rest of your life is something which you know, people don't think about really. You can't do that. You know, you need to really have a lot of, to be um, completely, what's the word for it, uh, um, resolved. And it, when you're 18 or, well, CT 25 and you're told your HIV infection, certain things may happen to you if you don't take the medication, if you so if you take the medication, you know, certain things, you, you, you probably can live a normal life, but you have to take it every day. It's very difficult. And people don't think of that. You know, and recently, as you know, with um, the um, MOH, I've got this MediSafe, MediShield Life. The first time ever we have insurance, health coverage for pre-existing illnesses, including HIV. I think this is a major step to trying to destigmatize and to have a bit more of a playing, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to treat HIV as, in, as a chronic illness and not have a moral judgment on it. Stigma is huge. It's huge. Everything, you know, I, I, think, I think that if you ask men in the street, do you know someone with HIV? They probably don't, would say no, but they may do, but they've never been told. No one tells them. Patients keep them, give it to themselves. It's just, it's just something which we've been fighting for is to empower patients to to tell the story. 
before AIDS, who would know, right? Before HIV infection, who would know that would be something which was sexually transmitted? And there were, I mean, it's conceivable that that might happen again if people stop using condoms because they think there's antiretroviral medication. Um, there's treatment now for HCV. Not cheap. <laughs> Very expensive treatment. And, and in many populations, it's also sexually transmitted. So, you know, and I mean, you, with all this globalization, easy travel, mixing of populations, um, AIDS, car, AIDS came out of probably the uh, Central and West Africa from, from, from gorillas and from monkeys, you know. There are still you know, lots of, that's also possible zoonotic infections which eventually get into the bloodstream and are sexually transmitted. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible from the STI point of view. For, for all the respiratory ones, I won't even comment. <laughs>